So uh, since uh, we all know the great news that uh, Professor Uhlenbeck was awarded the prestigious Abu Prize, I'd like to start with a famous old theorem, the Uhlenbeck theorem, uh, published in 1976. So let's state the theorem. Suppose we have uh, n-dimensional closed manifold. Then uh, Uhlenbeck proved that for generic set of Riemannian matrix, so the following three uh, properties holds for the Laplacian eigenvalue and eigenfunctions. So first, he proved that the Laplacian eigenspaces are all one-dimensional, uh, which means that the eigenvalues are simple. Uh, B, he proved that zero is a regular value for uh, all the eigenfunctions. And C, he proved that, uh, she proved that uh, all the eigenfunctions are Morse, so the critical points are non-degenerate. So the talk I'm going to give today is uh, analog in, in the theory of minimal surfaces for this similar theorem. So particularly, uh, what I'm prove can be viewed as analog of property A. I'm going, I'm going to prove that the uh, nonlinear um, eigenfunctions, which are minimal surfaces for the uh, volume spectrum, are simple. So that's analog for A. And for B, actually, I don't know any analogs. <laughs> for C, this would, the analog in the minimal surface theory would be the famous theorem of uh, Brian White, who proved that for generic set of Riemannian matrix, all minimal surfaces are non-degenerate. OK, so let's go back to uh, uh, minimal surfaces. So uh, I apologize if some of you sit in my uh, lecture at uh, the Princeton University. I'll try to give more details today. Um, so in my talk, uh, uh, this is M will be a closed Riemannian manifold. And uh, sigma is always a hypersurface. So we are interested in the area functional. So this denotes the area of sigma. So with respect to this given Riemannian metric. So the first thing about that is the uh, first variation formula. of the area functional, so which says that uh, if you have a, a hypersurface and if you deform it by a ambient vector field, you calculate what changes to the area. So what you have is, uh, so this means the deformation of the original sigma by certain ambient vector field. So that's the integral of the mean curvature vector dotted with, uh, this is uh, deformation vector field. So we know that uh, so sigma is minimal. So if and only if the first variation is zero, and if and only if the mean curvature is identically equal to be zero. So the first question is about the existence of such a minimal surface. So we have the famous theorem of uh, Armgren piece. So. So this started from the 60s, and uh, this results ended in the early 80s. So what they prove is that uh, if the ambient dimension is between 3 and 6, so this uh, closed Riemann manifold, so always admits at least one closed, uh, smooth closed embedded minimal surfaces. Okay. So dimension range is due to the compactness theory and has been extended by Shane and Simon to higher dimensions, allowing a singular site. So motivated by this theorem, so uh, Yao pose is a famous conjecture in the 80s. I think that's uh, in another uh, special year for geometry at the institute where y'all post this conjecture. You see that every uh, close three manifold, so at so infinitely many uh, 
close minimal surfaces. And we know that this has been solved by combining the work of uh, uh, Fernando, Marcus, Andre Nevis, and, uh, and Antoine Sun. Oh, it happens very uh, recently last year. OK, so uh, what I was doing is related to a program uh, proposed by Fernando and Andre. Uh, so towards solving this conjecture. So the moral of the theme of this conjecture is we try to establish a more theory for the area functional in the space of hypersurfaces. For the area functional. OK, so then the first question would be uh, in which space are we going to try to uh, find a more theory? So the space uh, they use is uh, denoted by by that. So this is the space of more two uh, hypercycles. So it should be the uh, one of the connect component. So of the space of more two cycles. In M. I mean the connect component containing zero, containing all amplitude sets, whatever. So for example, uh, uh, a way to visualize this is as follows, for which I'm going to give you a proof later. So suppose that this is ambient space. So uh, an element would be a hypersurface that separates the manifold into two parts. So say this part is omega, this is m minus omega. So we should say that uh, this is in Zn. So if and only if this is written as uh, the boundary of some domain, and that's the same as the boundary of the other side, since we use the uh, Z2 coefficients, we don't distinguish the orientation. I mean, this is an intuitive, intuitive way to understand, and I'm, I'm going to give you a, a heuristic proof later about this fact. OK, so the reason to study the space of mode 2 hypercycles is because this space has a very uh, fruitful topology. So the uh, early work of Amgren. So he calculate all the homotopy group of this huge space. So using Z2, so the fundamental group is Z2. And any higher homotopy group is uh, 0. Kay. So then from the basic homotopy theory, we know that uh, um, this huge space is uh, weakly homotopic to the infinite dimensional projective space, the weakly homotopic. Uh, particularly, we know that uh, the uh, cohomological ring is uh, very nice. So using the Z2 coefficients, so this is the polynomial ring over Z2. And uh, he, so here is this lambda, it's a generator. So I'm going to give you a geometric interpretation for this generator uh, very soon. OK, so this is a fruitful structure. It's very uh, natural to think about the area functional being defined over this space. And uh, so a uh, very rough question is, can we use uh, topology here to give a critical point 
of the area functional, which would be uh, minimal surfaces. So if you're successful, then we have so many topology that you should produce uh, at least a list of uh, uh, infinite many minimal hypersurfaces. So that's their uh, 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 basic idea based on the, the, the part of the topology. OK, so uh, to continue, we move a little bit to analysis. So that's a notion of uh, volume spectrum. So we try to uh, formulate the relation between this space and the critical, critical values of the area, area functional. So the notion was first mentioned by Gromov in 88, and then amended by Larry Goose in 2009 and uh, used uh, successfully by Fernando and Andre. So this is uh, 2013. So to uh, describe the volume spectrum, let's quickly uh, remind you what is how, how, how can we define the uh, spectrum for the Laplacian operator, or even for a simple finite dimensional uh, self-adjoint or symmetric uh, matrix. So if you have a matrix, then you can formulate the uh, associated value quotients. So say, give a p-dimensional plane or k-dimensional plane in Rn, you can maximize the uh, Rayleigh quotient and then take the infimum over all p-dimensional planes. Using this way, you can produce all the eigen eigenvalues for symmetric matrix. And you want to generalize as to this nonlinear problem. So the first thing is, how do we define a, a k-dimensional, p-dimensional plane in this nonlinear space? So that's a notion of p-sweep out introduced by Fernando and Andre. So let me define the p-sway part. So we have a continuous, continuous map from some space into the n. So this x would be a, a parameter space, finite dimensional parameter space. So continuous map is called a k sweep out. So where k is an uh, integer. So if it satisfies the following cohomological condition, see, so, so we pull back the generator uh, up to the k cup product, then this is elements. Uh, this is elements in the uh, k cohomological group on x. We require this is not zero. So that's a cohomological condition for a uh, case report. So uh, from the definition, we first know that uh, so the dimension or the, the or dimension of the top strata of X should be greater or equal than k. So if uh, less than k, uh, the, the case cohomological cohomology should be zero. And uh, to give you some feeling about uh, what we can take for the parameter space, so definitely you can take X to be say R. P k prime for any k prime greater than k, and or you can take uh, x to be r p k prime connects them with some other uh, space. As far as you you make it satisfying this condition, so it is a, a legitimated uh, generalized k-dimensional plane. Okay. So uh, finally, let me quickly explain uh, what does mean for a one sway pot. So, uh, so for one sweep out, uh, we would take x to be a circle. So then you have uh, uh, one parameter family of hypersurfaces. For that to be a sweep out, we require that uh, uh, the, 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 the union of them sweep out the whole manifold. So um, intuitively, for one parameter family to be a one sweep out, we require it to cover the whole manifold exactly once up to cancellation of uh, orientations. Okay. So that's the reason why we call it the sweep out because of uh, uh, the one dimensional case. And then we generalize to call it a k dimensional sweep out when k is greater than one. OK, so uh, this is the notion for, um, yeah, that's the notion for generalized k dimensional plane. So then we can define the case 
volume spectrum. Just by mimicking well, what we do for uh, eigenvalue for symmetric matrix. So um, it denoted by omega k. It's a real number, non active real number, depends only on the metric and the ambient space. So what you do is you first take an uh, arbitrary k sway port, and then you take the maximum area. And then you take infimum over all possible k Uh So if you, if you think about how you do this for symmetric matrix, the only thing you change is you change k slipper to a k-dimensional plane and change the area function to the radical quotients. So it's really a very analogous things here. That's uh, also a reason why I, I would say this is a, a analog for a uh, Wollenbeck theorem, because he deals with, he de he de he she deals with uh, Rayleigh quotient while we deal with the area function. So we know that this satisfies the following inequalities. So it's a non decreasing sequence of positive numbers. So uh, I would say that this inequality, this strictly sign, is very hard to prove, and it's due to Armgren in his very first paper. OK, so now we define the critical values. So you would ask whether these critical values are associated with uh, critical points, which are minimal surfaces. So that's a hard analytical part of the theory. So that's a mean max theorem. So I should mention a few names. So I'm going to prove the existence of X solution and please prove the regularity for the dimensions between 3 and 6. And then Shin Simon. So uh, this is 81. Draw us to all dimensions. Well, in higher dimensions, you should allow single set of co-dimension 7. And uh, Fernando and Andre draw us to the uh, D2 coefficients together with uh, very powerful Morse index upper bounds. So, so the general so D2 coefficients is 2013, and then with the Morse index estimates in 15. So combining all the works, we can state the theorem as follows. So, um, so let me only state the case when we have uh, regular minimal surfaces. So I restrict to lower dimensions. So for any integer k, so uh, there exists So a disjoint collection of so smooth, closed, connected, embedded, so minimal hypersurfaces. So, um, which I denoted by sigma ki. So i is from one to lk, such that so the uh, case volume spectrum can be written as the sum of the areas. However, you need to allow. You need to have an integer coefficients here. So these are called the multiplicities. And moreover, uh, Fernando and Andre prove that the sum of the index of the support is bounded from above by k. Okay. A bit tight here. So this equation says that uh, the volume spectrum are realized by the area of close, uh, smooth closed embedded minimal hypersurfaces, but with such certain integer multiplicities, 
And the second this is a contribution from Randall Andre. They proved that uh, the Morse index, for which I will give a definition very soon, is very analogous to what uh, uh, Matt defined for the uh, Einstein and the Young Mills functionals, spawned from above by k. So that's because they are running a k parameter variational theory. OK, so. Uh, I only stated this. I mean, they, they only prove the regular case. Okay, so uh, one of the remarks is why do we have uh, these integers? So this set of integers or multiplicities arise due to the uh, use of uh, compactness theory for minimal surfaces. So we all know that if you take a, a limit or sequence of minimal hypersurfaces, even a connected guy can collapse into a multiple cover of the limit. For instance, the limit, a uh, blow down of the cutenoid would be a double plane. So, so these uses the shin simon yoke which are estimates and compactness. So this is uh, the compactness in higher dimensions. So the limit, uh, a priori, will always have uh, multiplicities. OK, so uh, um, let's, let's try to see what we would have using this theory together with, uh, uh, with this topological structure. So if you apply the theory to each of them, so if you apply the theory to the first volume spectrum, you produce a non-trivial uh, closed minimal surface, which, was, uh, w which would be the Armgrand Pitts theorem. So if you apply to the here higher uh, volume spectrum, you may get uh, just inter integer cover or multiple cover of the previous minimal surfaces. So that's a big obstacle to towards the solve of the Yost conjecture, where, where the solution uses indirect uh, arguments. So um, uh, motivated by uh, Wollenbeck theorem, you would uh, say, can we ask a similar question? I, I would imagine that's one of the motivation Fernando and Andre made this conductor. So, so you just ask whether you can have them all identical to one in a, in a generic set of metrics. So the uh, first made the conjecture in 15, then they uh, strengthened that in 18. So uh, the conjecture would be uh, still for the smooth dimensions. So, uh, so for bumpy metric, I'm going to explain to you what does that mean. But we know that the set of bumpy metrics are generic, so they're corresponding to a generic set of metrics. So the set of minimal surfaces for each k are all two-sided. and uh, have multiplicity one. Okay. So that's a so-called multiplicity one conjecture. Uh, yeah, as I said, that's analog of property A, that uh, for the Laplacians, for the linear problem, all the eigenspaces are one-dimensional. So here, um, just say that uh, th these coefficients are all one. Okay. Uh, I'll present a proof for this conjecture, but let me first uh, explain you uh, the uh, terminologies I use, say what, what does it mean for two-sided hypersurface, what does it mean for a metric to be bumpy, and also how do we define precisely the uh, Morse index for the area functional. So sigma is uh, a two-sided 
if so there exists a unit normal so vector fields so if you can find uh, everywhere uh, unit normal vector field this is two sided you can see a, a plus and minus side okay so uh, once we have a two-sided minimal hypersurface, let's talk about the second variation. Um, so this time, I'm considering a vector field that's a scalar multiple of this unit normal. So if you push a, a hypersurface along x and take the second derivative of the area functional, you would have the following formula. So this is the uh, integral of uh, Laplacian phi square minus, so this is the Ricci curvature of the ambient space, evaluate as a normal, plus A is the second fundamental form square. This is the second fundamental form square. So this is a zero order term. It's also a Schrodinger type operator. And if you want to write it, that's minus phi L sigma phi. So where it, there, there's all sigma is the uh, Jacobi operator. That's minus Laplacian, minus. So this is a Ricci term, uh, nu nu, plus a square times phi. Kay. So that's the second version formula. Uh, so then the Morse index. This we denoted by index sigma. It's just the uh, number of uh, negative eigenvalues of uh, this Jacobi operator. Okay, so that's uh, very much the same as what Matt talked about the Young Mills functional and this uh, Einstein functional for uh, Einstein metrics. Okay, so now we can define uh, what does it mean for a bumpy metric. Uh, to be a bumpy metric, we require all uh, closed minimal immersions to be non-degenerate uh, for this second variation. G is bumpy if every smooth closed one more immersion sigma is a non degenerate or if if you have a solution then it has to be constantly zero. Okay. So that's the uh, definition of a bumpy metric. As a theorem of brown white So it proves that the set of uh, bumpy metrics are generic. Uh, this is a generic set in the bare sense. Okay. So then this conjecture can be uh, can be viewed exactly as analog of uh, Ullenbeck theorem A. So generically, uh, the against against this are simple. Okay. So uh, I'll just. Proof, uh, uh, present uh, a proof of a taint. So this conjecture is, is true. Kay. So let me quickly remind you what we were trying to uh, do along the direction of proving this conjecture. So we first try to uh, people first try to look at the problem for this uh, one parameter min max. So the pioneer work was done when the ambient metric has a positive Ricci curvature, and that was uh, uh, I think one of the breakthrough work in the field of min max theory by Fernando Andre in 2011. And then I generalized this in my thesis and in a future paper to higher dimensions, and later. Uh, so Catover, Marcus Nevis, strengthened all the results and uh, gave the satisfying multiplicity one result for Pauli Ricci for one parameter min max, and for bumpy metrics, 
out of one parameter. So Fernando and Andre also give a very satisfying answer, which says that all the one parameter min max uh, has multiplicity one from bumping metric. So this is uh, uh, shortly after this paper. And uh, last year, we realized another uh, big breakthrough. That's for uh, three manifolds, but for, for all k. So that was the work by uh, Otis Chodosh and Christos uh, Mantolidis. So they proved this uh, conjecture for the Allen Kahn setting. So there's a mirror conjecture in the setup of Allen Kahn equations, and they uh, completely solve that conjecture. So that's the history we know about this uh, whole story. OK, so uh, any questions or comments up to here? So uh, let me uh, just uh, briefly discuss a, a little bit about uh, uh, applications. And I'll give you a bit of proof of one of the application to give you a, a little bit of flavor of what I'm going to use. Uh, so uh, definitely the first application would be a direct proof of uh, partial answer to Yaw's conjecture for, for bumping metrics and for positive Ricci curvature metrics. So, so I won't state the results here, because I, I think you all know what that means. So another uh, interesting application I'm uh, excited about is the weighted Morse index upper bound conjecture by Fernando and Andre. So uh, let's go back to see the original statement about uh, this mean max theorem. So Fernando Andre proved that uh, the sum of the index for the support is bounded by k. But you would imagine that uh, you want to count in the multiplicity in this index upper bounds. So uh, if you're able to perturb the metric to make sure multiplicity is always 1, then you can obtain it by, uh, by taking a limit. So now I'm going to state the, the version for that. So uh, still we are in these uh, lower dimensions. This time, G is arbitrary metric. So then, for the set of uh, minimal surfaces obtained in the min-max theorem, we have the stronger Morse index upper bounds. So um, the sum, I, I need to separate the collection of minimal surfaces into two groups, this two-sided group and the one-sided groups. So if sigma i is, uh, is two-sided, so we're allowed to multiply the uh, index by the integer multiplicity. And if this is a one-sided, so actually, uh, I proved in my thesis that if it's one-sided, it has to, the, the multiplicity always has to be an even number. So you can divide it by, by 2. Multiply. So this is bounded by k. Okay, so the remark is that. Uh, so, so mi is an even integer if sigma i is two-sided. Oh, sorry, one-sided. Okay. So this is a stronger version for the Morse index upper bounds. Okay. Concerning the Morse index upper bounds, a friend and Andre were able to prove that for a bumpy metric, uh, what you get, the sum is exactly k. It's not only bounded from above by k, it's also bounded from below by k, the sum. Okay. So uh, the proof it would be a direct uh, corollary of the multiplicity one and the more index upper bounds. But I'd like to present some of the details so as to prepare you for uh, some of the technical work later. So uh, let's, let's do it here. So I proved that theorem using the assumption of multiplicity one. 
OK, so uh, for arbitrary metric, we perturb it to be bumpy. We'll take a sequence of bumpy metrics, which denoted by G alpha, such that uh, G alpha converges to G. Um, it's a simple fact that uh, from the definition of the volume spectrum, this corresponding volume spectrum for G alpha will converge to that of uh, G. So, so then we apply the multiplicity one together with upper bounds to, uh, to this, uh, this guy, and so as to see what happens in the limit. So we know that uh, so omega k g alpha is the sum of the area of sigma alpha alpha i. For simplicity, so later I will try to assume there's only one connect component, so the proof would be the same. And uh, so the sum of the Morse index. Bounded from above by k. Okay. So then it's a uh, place to apply the compactness theorem for minimal surfaces. This was uh, proved by Ben Sharp based on the work of Shin Simon Yao and Shin Simon. That's a very nice theorem. OK, so uh, the idea behind Sharp's compactness theorem is that if you have a sequence of minimal surfaces with uniformly bounded area and uniform bounded Morse index, you can localize so that away from at most k points, uh, you always have a stable piece. And for stable piece, so Shin Simon Yale and Shin Simon proved that they have uniform curvature estimates, then you can take subsequence to uh, get a smooth limit. And then you do removal singularity. Uh, so by uh, his theorem, so a subsequence of so we will convert this to a smooth limit. So sigma infinity i. So that convert would be smooth away from finite many points. So smoothly <laughs> away from finite <coughs> at most key points. Okay. So from here, let's assume that uh, we have only one connect component. Uh, so I assume that all of the set has only one connect components. So let's see. Uh, uh, more carefully about the local picture. So then there are two cases. Case one is that the limit is uh, two-sided. So you have a two-sided limits. And I said that uh, you need to pass uh, a, a few bad points. But I'll show you how to get rid of these bad points. So these are uh, two-sided. So s say that. Uh, our goal is to prove that we have an upper bound for the Morse index. So, so I, I, I show that Morse index is a number, a number of negative eigenvalues. But there's another way to describe the Morse index. That is to use a vector fields. So the Morse index would be the maximal dimension of linear independent set of vector fields along sigma. So I'm going to use this point of view a little bit. So I'm going to choose a vector fields along, along this guy so that uh, uh, second variation is negative, and I'm going to pick a maximal linear independent site. So let uh, oh xj be a maximal site of uh, so linear independent
So vector fields such that uh, so the second variation applies to x is negative. Okay. So by definition, we know that uh, k prime is the Morse index. <coughs> So by definition, k prime is the index of sigma infinity. So you want to show that uh, the multiplicity m multiplied with k prime is less equal than k. OK, so let's go back to uh, Sharpe's compactness theorem. We, we know that it can work with the limit smoothly away from finite many points. So uh, these points are really bad. So, um, so as I, uh, I want to remark that we can, we can localize so these vector fields such that uh, so the support is a compact subset of the limit minus bad points. So the reason is because the uh, hypersurface has dimension at least a two. If you multiply a cutoff function, so the uh, second variation formula does not detect that. So you, ca you can choose a very small cutoff function to localize the support away from the bad points. And you only change the second variation a little bit, you can still make sure it's negative. So everything uh, works through. So the reason we can localize away is because if the vector fields are, are localized over here, so now it's away from here, so you can pass this to the limit. OK, so let's continue. So by the compactness, we know that uh, sigma alpha so has a decomposition. So uh, as an so I'm sheeted so graph so over sigma infinity. So here m is a, is a multiplicity. So I have only one connect component. So I only have one integer. So here, if I draw a picture, you will see that. Uh, uh, so we don't know what happens over here, but over here, you have very nice. So put all of them together, you get sigma alpha. <laughs> so since x is uh, uh, support is away from the bad points, so xg naturally passes into uh, sigma alpha. So um, so we know that x extends to sigma alpha, uh, so that uh, the second variation over sigma alpha of x. Uh, G is also negative by the smooth convergence. Okay. So finally, what we would do is that uh, let me give the graph a name. So sigma alpha uh, i. So i is from 1 to m. So these are the m different uh, sheets. So if we restrict it to xg to x alpha uh, I, so in total you would have uh, so G is from one to K prime, and I is from one to M. So this would be a, a linear independent set. <coughs> over sigma alpha, and it satisfy this requirement. Okay. So see, the convergence is not good. Uh, uh, so near a few bad points, but you can do a localization away from that. And then the vector field passes to them. So because the, the sheets are separate, so the support of them, I mean, for different i, the support are disjoint. So they're naturally linear independent. And on each connected parts, we know that already linear independent by, by the assumption and by the smooth convergence. So eventually, you'll get m times k prime uh, number of linear independent uh, vector fields over sigma alpha. Okay. So, so this actually tells you that uh, if you're combining all of them, so k prime times uh, is should m times that is less equal than k, because th uh, the index is less equal than k. Does that make sense? Okay. 
So this is a case for the two-sided uh, limits. So if you have uh, one-sided limits, you can almost do the same thing, but I'll tell you how you get uh, m divided by 2. So, so if uh, the limit is one-sided, so we do everything the same, besides you need to take a double cover of something. So what you do is to, to look at uh, the double cover of a tubular neighborhood of sigma infinity. So if you think about RP2 in RPK, a tubular neighborhood uh, topologically is something with a boundary. The boundary is a double cover. So you need to take a double cover tubular neighborhood. So um, then you got the same picture. The only difference is that sigma alpha had decomposed so as uh, m divided by 2 sheeted so graph. Okay. So then you, you run the same arguments. Eventually, you can only prove this. That's how you get uh, this m, uh, mi divided by 2. OK. OK, so uh, later I would like to go back to this type of convergence picture again. So I, I hope this is a warm up. So in the last minutes for the first part, I'd like to give you a, a general idea of how I approach uh, the proof. And then we go back to figure out some of the details. So as we said that the multiplicity ar ar arise because we use this uh, convergent theory, especially if you look at this picture, you have multiplicity by taking limits. Um, another way to understand is that if two pieces of minimal hypersurfaces touch each other, they have to be identical to each other because of strong maximum principle. So um, uh, what I eventually found is that if you perturb to some other functional for which this strong maximum principle is uh, broken, so you have some hope to, to, to continue. Okay. So that's a strategy. We try to approximate the area functional by by a lock down. I use a lock lock multiplier. So the functional is written as follows. So suppose, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, these hypersurfaces that are interesting in can always be written as a boundary of some site. So I, I pick one of the open side bounded by sigma. And I take a, a smooth function. So this is a, a smooth function. So then uh, we consider this uh, Laclangi multiplier functional. So it's, uh, it's the Laclangi multiplier for the area. So I still use A as it related to the function H as it defined over the open side. So it's this area of the boundary subtract the integral of H. So this is a functional that I use with uh, Jonathan in our uh, study of the constant mean curvature surface and uh, surfaces with uh, uh, prescribed mean curvature. OK, so if now if we do the first version formula for this new functional, we would have the following. So say that uh, if, if a smooth hypersurface is the critical point of this functional, so what we would have is that if we take the first version for the area part, you get the mean curvature. So actually, this is a mean curvature with respect to the outer normal. So this is the mean curvature for, for that uh, sign. 
is uh, equal to be the uh, uh, ambient function h restricted to sigma. So uh, this is usually called the prescribing mean curvature. Uh, type equations of PMC. You can call it the PMC surfaces or PMC uh, equations. So we, uh, in our study uh, of the uh, existing theory with Jonathan, so we uh, realized that uh, this type of uh, equations uh, can break the uh, strong maximum principle in the following way. OK, so. So, uh, so I, we called it like uh, so the one-sided maximum principle. So this PMC equation satisfies. So this one-sided maximum principle. As follows. So it can be shown by drawing the following two pictures. So say if you have a, a piece of surface such that this mean curvature vector is given by, uh, by h times nu. So if you have another piece that points the same direction. OK, so let me just assume a special case. So let's assume that uh, h is strictly positive. And we found that uh, we can find a generic set of H so that this uh, one-sided maximum principle holds. And positive functions is a subset of this generic set. So, so if H is positive, you have two pieces whose mean curvature points to each other, say like two spheres or two cylinders points towards each other. So we were able to prove that the touching set is small. So, so they can only touch at uh, a set of. Uh, Co-dimension one. So example is spheres touch touches over spheres touch over a point or cylinder touch over a line. Okay. So that's one case. So the other case is that uh, if the all points to to the other side. So they can never touch. So. So fortunately, uh, in our study of the uh, CMC and PMC problems, this would be the only two cases that appears. So for instance, if the two pieces have their mean curvature all points upwards, they can still be identical to each other. That is the other side. So this is a good side. You have another bad side. And the bad side never appear. OK? So, so, so if you are in the right position, so this strong maximum principle tells you that the limit uh, is either like properly embedded with multiplicity one, or it has a touching set of co-dimension one. This is a strong Alexandro embedding, which is also sort of multiplicity one. Okay, so should here be a good point to uh, take a break. Uh, we'll go back to see how we can use this, this functional to uh, approach this multiplicity one problem. <laughs>